<laughs> okay, yeah. Uh, good morning, everyone. <laughs> good morning. So uh, it's nice that there are some chance for some other people to come as well. Can you hear okay? Is it good enough? Uh, bring it down a little bit. Uh, okay. Is that, is that better? Yes. Okay. So uh, nice to see you all. Uh, and nice to see some new faces, although the old faces are also here, which is great. Uh, and uh, the um, uh, topic uh, for this morning is right view in practice. And uh, the reason uh, for this topic is that right view, I'll explain this in a second, is a very important part of the Buddhist path. Uh, I'll explain why that is the case. Uh, but the second reason why I like this topic is because uh, for many people, right view ends up as a kind of a, a theoretical thing, something that we know at the back of our mind, uh, but it doesn't necessarily have much impact on our lives. Uh, yeah? It becomes like an idea, an intellectual exercise, but doesn't actually have any oomph in our practice, doesn't cause us to practice any better, doesn't cause us to, doesn't change our life in a sense. Uh, but the idea with right view uh, is that it's supposed to have an impact. Uh, yeah, when you think about the world in a certain way, it's supposed to have some sort of emotional impact on you. You're supposed to feel, whoa, this is what it means. Yeah, and then it's supposed to drive you forward and give you that push that pushes you on to the Buddhist path and makes you live a better life and a more meaningful life as a consequence. And this is why it is so important. So we need to make right view practical. Yeah, so that when you, after you have understood a little bit about right view, and hopefully that will happen this morning. Yeah. Maybe it won't. Yeah, we'll, we'll take a poll afterwards. We'll see how many people have really got the idea afterwards. Yeah. <laughs> and if you uh, feel after right view that you want to practice more, you want to uh, get into you know, doing the sila properly, you want to do a bit of meditation practice, whatever it is, then you know that right view has done something to you. This is what it's supposed to do. Yeah. Yeah? And then it, you know it works. And the reason why uh, why it is so important is precisely this. And you look at the uh, Noble Eightfold Path, you know the Noble Eightfold Path, it starts off with right view. And one of the things to understand about the Noble Eightfold Path is that it is eight factors, but those eight factors are not just eight random factors, they are eight structured factors that come in a certain sequence. And because they come in a sequence, the first one is the most important one. Yeah, once you have the first one in place, then actually that means that the second one uh, is conditioned by the first one. So the second one then is more likely to arise. Actually, it will arise if the first one is properly in place. Yeah? If the second one does not arise, the second one is Samma Sankappa, Noble Eightfold Path, can be translated as right intention, right aim, right purpose in life, right goal. Yeah, these are all rights, right way of, of translating Samma Sankapa. Some translate as right thought. The idea is that you get a meaning in life, a purpose in life, which is greater. So if your purpose doesn't change, yeah, if your aim doesn't change, then right view hasn't really worked properly. Right view is to, it should make you change your direction, uh, uh, steer in a new way. Uh, you know, you t take the rudder of your, your little boat, yeah, this is your, yourself, this is kind of your boat, and you steer in a new, new direction. You used to go to the south, uh, the south was the path where you get all the pleasures of the world, uh, now you steer a little bit more to the north, uh, where you have the spiritual happinesses instead. Uh. And this is the point of this. So the Noble Eightfold Path starts off with the right view, and the more that right view is in place, uh, the more the whole Noble Eightfold Path uh, becomes an automatic thing uh, that happens by itself. Uh. This is kind of the beauty of Buddhism, yeah? It's kind of automatic. Yeah? So all you have to do is get the basic thing into place. Uh, when the basic thing is in place, uh, everything else happens as a consequence. Uh. This is why Buddhism is so easy, yeah, if you get it right, uh, yeah, one thing you have to do, the first thing, and everything else happens as a more or less as a consequence of that. Uh. So this shows you the power of uh, right view. Not only is it important for in the Noble Eightfold Path, and when you have the right aim, you have the right intention, then come all the factors of morality uh, on the Noble Eightfold Path, Samma Vajra, Samma Kamanta, Samma Ajiva, then you have the uh, right effort, Samma Vayama or Samma Padana, and this is an alternative word is used in the suttas, which is, has to do with purifying yourself. Not only that, but 
Samaditi is also very important for the meditation practice itself. Uh, when you read about the Satipatthana, Satipatthana is of course all about meditation in the suttas, uh, and the uh, crux of Satipatthana, you can summarize that as the mindfulness of breathing. Mindfulness of breathing fulfills all the Satipatthana practice. Uh, it's all you have to do is mindfulness of breathing. Uh, again, very simple, keep it easy and simple. Uh, but uh, in the Satipatthana Sangyutta, which is the collection of all the various suttas on Satipatthana, the Buddha says that there is two things that are the foundation for Satipatthana practice. One of those you probably know already is morality. Yeah, you have to live a moral life. Otherwise, how can you stay in the present moment if you don't live a moral life? You have to make the present moment the pleasant moment. This is Ajahn Brahm. Yeah? Ajahn Brahm loves to play around with the words. I'm just stealing Ajahn Brahm's ideas. Oops. Oh, Samma uh, Kamanta. No, Samma. <laughs> so, we, so, but, but it's, it's a nice way of thinking about it. Yeah? Make the present moment the pleasant moment. And you do that by living well. When you live well, you feel good about yourself, then meditation becomes possible. And we all know that that is true to some extent. But the other thing which is interesting here, which is more kind of uh, not so obvious perhaps, is that right view as well. It's called Ujjuka Ditti in the Satipatthana Sangyutta. It means straight view. is actually a foundation for meditation to be possible. Why is that the case? And the reason why it is the case, there are a number of reasons, but one of the main reasons why it is the case is if you understand where to look for real happiness. When I mean real happiness, I mean like real, profound, deep stillness, peace, contentment, all of these kind of things. When you know where to look for that, then your attitude in life changes. Your priorities change. What is valuable to you change. And then you start to value the meditation practice more. And so you come to, uh, you do a little bit of meditation at home, you maybe occasionally go on retreats. If you don't do it, it's okay. But this becomes the inclination of the mind because you know that this is where happiness is to be found. Yeah? In the final sense, in the deeper sense on the Buddhist path. So your attitude to meditation depends on your view. Yeah? And this may not be obvious because maybe you think, yeah, but I've got right view. It doesn't make any difference. Yeah, I believe in rebirth. But very often these ideas are kind of an intellectual exercise. Yeah, I believe in rebirth, I believe in karma, what next? Yeah, and it doesn't really sink in deep enough. It doesn't actually touch you in a deep way. And that's why it doesn't have an impact on your meditation practice. So how can we make this more deep? How can we understand right view in such a way that it actually really it challenges, it challenges you a little bit. It makes, uh, makes you emotionally connected to the Dhamma in a more profound way, so that it gives you... Emotions are so important, yeah? Because emotions, uh, we have to be honest, that's what drives us in the world. Uh, in a way, you can say that feelings, feeling happy or feeling sad, these are just emotions. Uh, these are fundamental things that drive us. Uh, we're always driven towards happiness and away from suffering and sadness. Uh, so emotions are fundamental. These are the things that kind of um, empower us and make us act and make us live in the world. Uh, so how can we get this going? And one of the, I'll t tell you one of the stories. This is a story that uh, Ajahn Brahm used to tell a long time ago, and which I found very inspiring when I first heard it. Uh, and this is about one of the monks in Sri Lanka. This is a Western monk, and he lived in Sri Lanka. He became a monk back in the 1950s, I think, uh, so quite a while ago now. And he became very famous because he was very he was very special, yeah, you could feel when you were around him that this was a very special person uh, with a, uh, thank you very much, that is very kind of you, huh? yeah, this is a, uh, this is a right view in practice, yeah, you, <laughs> very good, <laughs> thank you. So, uh, he was famous and many people regarded him as an arahant, he certainly had very good samadhi, uh, and he was the kind of monk who, he started off his life on a place in Sri Lanka called the Island Hermitage. Have you heard about the Island Hermitage? Yeah? It's a very famous place in Sri Lanka that was started by another German monk called Nana Tiloka back in the 1920s or something like that, a long, quite a while ago. It was the very beginning when the very first Westerners started to become interested in Buddhism. So he started the Island Hermitage, uh, and then this other man came. He, he, he was Venerable Nyana Vimala, was his name. Uh, 
And he spent 10 years on Island Hermitage, where he's very secluded, and all he did was study, uh, studying the suttas, uh, yeah? reading the suttas, and memorizing them. Uh. And the reason why he wanted to memorize them, because he was like an old-fashioned Buddhist. Uh, instead of having a laptop, I have a laptop, you know that? Uh, it's al oh, <laughs> almost embarrassing to say, I have a laptop, I have it with me here. So uh, it's, quite, it's quite handy, but I th don't think he would have approved of that. Uh, he would have said, I was a bad monk, I should throw out the laptop and live more simply. And maybe he's right. Uh, but um, anyway, so he didn't have a laptop. This was before the days of the laptops, of course. Uh, so he had to memorize all the suttas. So he spent the first 10 years of his life on the island hermitage, uh, uh, learning the basics of the Dhamma, memorizing the suttas and practicing meditation. Yeah? This was the two things that he did. Uh. And after 10 years on this very austere island, uh, he became even more austere. Uh. Yeah? Then he started wandering around Sri Lanka. And he wandered around the island of Sri Lanka, often not staying more than one night in one place, uh, finding suitable places for meditation, staying there for a while, then wandering on. Uh. And all he had was his three robes, uh, a small arms ball uh, and a tiny little bag with requisites. Yeah? Maybe a needle, maybe some thread to sew his robes uh, and these kind of things. Uh. And this is how he lived for 40 years. Uh. Can you imagine doing that? Uh? <laughs> It's hard to imagine, isn't it? Even just the thought of that kind of sounds like extreme suffering, doesn't it, for most people? But remember to think about this in the right way. And the right way to think about this is actually to allow it to inspire you. Because what this shows you, if someone can live like that, and remember this was a very happy person, yeah? He was much more happy than most people. He would never shout at anyone, he would always have a smile on his face, he was meditating, he would be a very calm and very peaceful person. He had all these qualities that everyone is looking for, and yet he lived this incredible simple life. How is that possible, you might ask? Well, that, that is precisely why it is possible. It is possible because you simplify, because you give up these other things. That is why you get there. So, what this does to you, if you think about this in the right way, it should inspire you. It is not only this monk, there are many monks, some nuns, yeah, as well, who live in this very simple way. And it should inspire you to understand that there is a happiness in the world that is more profound, that is more meaningful, that is available to each one of us than the ordinary happinesses of life. And when you remember that, then it gives you a sense of a sense of uplift, a sense of there is, you know, if this is all we have in, in the ordinary life, you have the ups and downs of ordinary life, it makes life kind of seem a little bit pointless. But once you have something more, something uh, profound, something deep, uh, it makes life more meaningful. Uh, and it gives you this feeling that there is something in the world that is really, truly worthwhile in a very, very profound way. Uh, and what a wonderful thing that is, uh, when it gives life more hope, more meaning, more purpose. Uh, so this is one of the ways of thinking about these uh, monastics, and not to, th not to think like of it as some kind of miracle that someone is able to live like that. Surely they must be suffering a lot. No, that's the whole point. They're not suffering a lot. They're living very simply, and yet they're more happy than anyone else. And this is kind of the, uh, the remarkable thing about this. Uh, so this is what this venerable Nana Vimala was doing. Yeah? He was really happy, living a very simple life. Uh, one day, one of the disciples, he was staying in a monastery somewhere, and one of the disciples who were there was asked, he was about to leave, so he was saying, oh, venerable, where are you going? Uh, oh, I will decide that when I get to the front gate. <laughs> <laughs> it's quite nice, isn't it? It's like, no decisions, no future, just walk, okay, left or right, okay, right, duk, duk. well, that was left, anyway, whatever. <laughs> Yeah, so it's kind of, it's living, really living in the present moment. No planning for the future, nothing like that at all. Uh, and this was what his life was like. And then uh, in, uh, I think it was in 1992, Ajahn Brahm was visiting Sri Lanka and he went around to some of the famous monasteries in Colombo. There's a famous monastery in Colombo called Vajira Nyan, Vajira Rama. And uh, this is where many of the most famous forest monks would go if they needed to stay in the city for a while because they had health problems uh, or whatever it was. And this was coming towards the end of the life of Venerable Nana Vimala. And so he was getting very sick and very frail by this stage, so he was staying in the city for a while. And then Ajahn Brahm went there, and Bhikkhu Bodhi was staying there, and many of these other very famous Sri Lankan monks were staying there as well. So Ajahn Brahm had already some connection with Venerable Bhikkhu Bodhi. So he asked him, you know, he, he, Ajahn Brahm had already spoken to all the well-known famous Sri Lankan monks who were there because he knew about them already. 
But Venerable Jana Vimala wasn't so famous because he was a forest monk. Yeah? So Ajahn Brahm asked Bhikkhubodhi, is there anyone I should meet here who you would recommend? And Bhikkhubodhi says, I have this special, special one, yeah? this really secret, uh, secret doctrine. Uh, please come with me. And he takes him to meet Venerable Jana Vimala. And uh, then what happens after that, uh, Ajahn Brahm says that he had got the best Dhamma talk that he ever had in his life. He heard from Venerable Nana Vimala. And remember, Ajahn Brahm has heard some pretty good Dhamma talks. Yeah? Ajahn Brahm has met all, many of the most famous forest masters in Thailand, including Ajahn Shah, including Ajahn Mahaboa, including many of these ones. And he has heard them all talk, been to the monasteries and all of that. Uh, so it must have been pretty special yeah? when, you, when he said it was the best one that he has ever heard. Uh, and uh, uh, after the talk, uh, he goes to Bhikkhu Bodhi didn't come in for the talk, yeah, because he wasn't used to Venerable Vimla giving talks. Uh, and afterwards, Ajahn Brahm said, Oh, yeah, he gave us a really nice talk. And Bhikkhu Bodhi was really upset, yeah, he, <laughs> he missed out on this beautiful talk, yeah. So, anyway, so what did he say? Why was this talk so good? Why was it the most amazing talk Ajahn Brahm had ever heard? And it's hard to say exactly why, because the Dhamma is the Dhamma. You can give it from different angles. But one of the things that Ajahn Brahm tells about in retrospect, one of the things that he uh, kind of made a big impact on him, why he was listening to this monk, was the story of why he went forth. Yeah, why did he decide to go forth? And of course, when someone decides to go forth, it is intimately related to the idea of right view. Yeah, because you go forth because you have seen something that makes you move from the lay life to the monastic life. Not always. Yes, sometimes people ask me, why did you become a monk? And I say, don't know. I, you know, I, I just said one day I found myself like this and I was a monk. <laughs> And sometimes it happens because of habits. I think I was probably a monk in the past life, so, or maybe I was a nun in the past life, so now I'm just kind of following the same trajectory, yeah, a little bit. And uh, maybe, maybe that's oversimplifying a little bit, but that's, you know, that's, sometimes that's how it works. But this phenomenon of Imola, he had a very powerful experience that made him become a monk. And this is why it is so interesting. And he told Ajahn Brahm this story. And some of you may have heard it before. This was a, uh, in the interwar period between the First World War and the Second World War. Uh, and this was in Germany. It was a time when, you know, the 1920s and 1930s were often a time, especially in Europe and America. I don't, not sure what it was like here in, a in Asia. But it was a time when people were indulging a lot and the economy was going quite well, at least until you had the crash on Wall Street in 1929 or something like that. So before that, it was a lot of, you know, people were messing around a lot. And so he was wandering around in the city. I'm not sure which city it was, Berlin perhaps? I'm not sure where it was. And uh, Berlin was one of the great cities of Europe already then, and it is now again as well. Uh, and uh, so he was wandering around, and he came to this uh, German Bierstube. Bierstube is like a beer cellar, yeah, at the bottom of the building, everyone is drinking away, a lot of young people there drinking beer and having a jolly good time. Uh, I, not that jolly, yeah, let's face it, but that, that's what they think is jolly, to drink lots of beer and kind of hanging around with your mates and, uh, you know, talking or whatever. But so they were there and they were all drinking and laughing and having a good time and all of this. And then uh, uh, while he was there, he was watching these people, uh, he saw that this was quite a tall building. They were at the very bottom in the basement, uh, in the third or fourth floor. These were all wooden buildings, uh, yeah? In the third or fourth floor, a fire had started. Uh, yeah, and of course, once a fire starts in a wooden building, it's quite scary. A wooden buildings they catch fire very quickly. And, uh, but these young people, they kind of looked up, yeah, no big deal, the fire is still far away. Yeah, just relax. And then some of the young people had a little bit of intelligence, they kind of moved away. Yeah? And after a while, the bartender moved, kind of left, yeah, because it was getting too dangerous. But then the young people thought, wow, that's even better. Now we have free beer, the bartender is gone. And it's kind of, you know, this is what happens, yeah? This is what people are like. People are stupid, yeah? We all have a little bit of that stupidity in us, unfortunately. Yeah. And so he was watching this, and as he was watching this, the fire was spreading, spreading from the top floor, gradually, gradually moving down, 
And these young people at the bottom, even though they knew the fire was there, they were just heedless. Eventually, more and more of them left, but still, eventually the building collapsed. And when the building collapsed, there were still a few of them left in that basement. He had drinking beer, and then the building collapsed, and many of them obviously died as a consequence of that. And when he saw this, yeah, he thought, wow, there's only one thing to do. I have to become a monk, Buddhist monk. Yeah. <laughs> It's the obvious, the obvious conclusion, right? It's the obvious conclusion. When you see a building collapse on young people, the conclusion is, must become a monk as a consequence. <laughs> and uh, because for him, it was a metaphor for samsaric existence. Yeah, it's a metaphor because as we are enjoying ourselves, as we are doing our daily activities, suddenly the world collapses around us. You have some major suffering, some major problem, or you even die, yeah? In the middle of your duties, in the middle of living your life, without really having reflected properly, without having kind of looked at things in perspective, one day suddenly everything comes crashing down on you. So he understood this as a metaphor for worldly life, for our ordinary existence. And because he understood it in that way, he then straight away he departed and he left and he became a monk in Sri Lanka soon afterwards. So why is this lesson so powerful? What is it about this particular thing that makes it so powerful? And the first thing is, of course, all the young people staying in the basement, drinking beer. This is a metaphor for heedlessness. Yeah, you are heedless. You don't really take proper care. You don't look at what's happening in your life. You don't have any perspective. You live your life on automatic without really reflecting properly. Yeah? And if you look around the world, this is how the majority of people live their lives. Yeah? It's all caught up in all the things that we have to do. But there are so many things to do, right? So we just have to do them. We have to give them priority. We have to look after our families. We have to do our work. And then we have to enjoy our entertainments. And then this takes up, already takes up 20 eight hours a day already, yeah? So we have negative four hours for spiritual practice. This is, <laughs> this is usually how it works, yeah? It's not that you have got zero, you get negative hours for spiritual practice. If you had more time, you would just fill it in with all the other stuff that you have to do as well. The waiting list is that long. No way that I have a chance to do any spiritual things. And so you are heedless, and this is what uh, is going on here. You carry on doing the same things. Life is so full of all the stuff. There's no time to reflect, no time to think about what actually matters, no time to think about the realities of life. So this is one side of the thing that he realized. Yeah? And there's a nice uh, simile in the suttas to describe this, and it's a simile of uh, uh, the person who is, uh, enters a jungle grove. Uh, yeah, the entering can be maybe understood as being reborn into the jungle. Uh, and then you wander around in the jungle. Uh, and the problem with being in the jungle is that you have no, you can't really see what's happening. Uh, the jungle is always very dense. Uh, yeah, you have jungle here in Malaysia, you know what it's like. I, have been, I went on a jungle walk last year with Bobby and a few other people here. It was very, very nice to walk in the jungle. It's so green and lush. Uh, I didn't see as many animals as I had hoped. No, I didn't see any snakes. Remember that? We were looking for snakes. We couldn't see them. Uh, yeah, that was a bit disappointing. But anyway. <laughs> because snakes, they bring you alive. You see the danger in life. So they kind of bang, you are alive suddenly. Uh, so uh, uh, you are in the jungle. You don't really have much perspective. Uh, you cannot see things. You cannot stand back. You don't get in any overview of what it is like. Uh, so you are a little bit trapped in that jungle. Uh, and this is what it's like to be trapped in the sensory realm. Yeah, our lives are all about the sensory things of the world. Uh, from the moment you wake up in the morning to the time you go at sleep at night, all we know is what we see, what we hear. The sensory world is everything we have pretty much. Uh, and then when you go to sleep, uh, you dream about it as well. Uh, yeah, just to make sure that 24 hour kind of sensory immersion, yeah, always immersed in sensory things. Uh, and uh, so this is the world that we know, and we don't have much perspective on that. Uh, sometimes we get a little bit of perspective, uh, yeah, when you feel a little bit peaceful, when you have a little bit of insight into the nature of existence, uh, you stand back a little bit, but a lot, most of the time, uh, we are immersed in that uh, uh, 100%. Uh, so this person wanders around in the jungle, and while you're wandering in the around in the jungle, uh, you're looking for pleasures, yeah, just like wandering around in the sensory realm, we're looking for the pleasures of life. So he comes, as he wanders around, he comes to a mango tree, 
And I think, wow, mango tree. Is there anyone here who likes mangoes? <laughs> okay, I should ask, is there anyone here who does not like mangoes? That's the right question, yeah? <laughs> almost everybody, if you have a nice, fresh, almost everybody likes a nice mango. It's very difficult to find people who don't like that. So, it comes, see that nice mango tree, the mangoes are just perfect, just ripe, not too soft, they haven't been, been sitting there too long, they're not too green, so they're just perfect, yeah? Sweet, beautiful, but they haven't really started to deteriorate yet. So he climbs up this tree, he has a big bag, yeah? And because the mangoes are so sweet and beautiful, he can't stop himself, he has to start eating right there in the top of the tree, and he eats away, yeah? Completely heedless, just completely engulfed in these mangoes doesn't know about anything else. The whole world stops because the mangoes are so nice. That's what it is like sometimes. When you really enjoy something, you, you are oblivious to everything else yeah? because it's just so nice what you're doing right now. And then as you're sitting in this mango tree, this other man comes into the same jungle. He also sees the same mango tree. He doesn't see the man because the man is way up there covered by leaves. Yeah? He doesn't see this man. But he says, wow, he says the mango, wow, this is really nice. But I don't know how to climb a tree, so I can't get hold of those mangoes. So he takes his axe out yeah, and starts chopping down the tree here. And of course, what happens if, if, if he is able to fell that tree with the axe, the guy in the top of the tree, he's going to have a problem, yeah? He's going to fall out, he's probably going to die, and if he doesn't die, he's going to have some very serious injuries because of that. And so, if he sits up there eating the mangoes completely heedless, he doesn't hear the axe, he doesn't hear anything, yeah, because he's heedless, tree falls down, you die. And you die because you were just so engulfed in the sensory uh, world, in the pleasures of the sensory world, in the pains of the sensory world, and just the sensory world in general. You'd lost perspective, and then you fall down, and one day you just die, and that's it. Everything is finished. You never had any wisdom, you never learned anything, and then you get reborn, and you carry on in exactly the same way. And the whole thing starts to look very stupid after a while. So this is what happens, yeah? This is how, this is that uh, simile of being engulfed in sensual pleasures. And this is why we tend to be heedless, because we lack that perspective. Uh. And this is one of the other similes you find in the suttas, which is in a sense is related to that. This is the simile uh, of the two men who come to the mountain, yeah? This, and they are at the foot of the mountain, uh, and uh, one of them says, I want to climb the mountain, come with me. No, no, I'm too lazy to climb the mountain. Yeah, this is the heedless people, they're too lazy. No, no, I don't want to climb the mountain, don't want to see. So the one of the men, he climbs the mountain, and then he stands at the top of the mountain, he says, wow, the view here is amazing. I can see all the fields, the villages, the roads, the rivers, I can see the pleasure groves, I can see everything from the top of the mountain. So he shouts down to his friend, hey, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Up here, I can see all these things. And the guy at the bottom says, no, rubbish, you can't see anything from the top of the mountain here. So he's really stupid, yeah, because the other guy is up there. So he comes down he, from the top of the mountain, he grabs his friend by the arm, pulls him up to the top. Okay, what do you see? And he becomes a bit sheepish, yeah, okay, yeah, I can see villages, yeah, roads, and all these kind of things. And the simile here, the simile here is about when you extract yourself from the ordinary sensory world, when you uh, do get maybe access to a deep state of insight or meditation practice, which is the goal of this path, suddenly the world looks very different. You have an oversight, you have an overview, you have extracted yourself from the ordinary life of the jungle, and suddenly you can see to the horizon, you can see far away, you can see all the patterns on the ground, all the things, the whole scenery, you can compare the jungle to the villages uh, and you understand the nature of that jungle because now you are above it. Uh, you understand the nature of the sensory world, the limitations of it, uh, the pleasures of it and why it is worthy of escape. Uh. And this is a simile for what happens in meditation practice. Uh, you extract yourself from the ordinary world of the five senses uh, and as you do that you understand, you're able to see the world uh, because when you are fully extracted from something, uh, when you're no longer immersed in something, uh, that is when you get perspective. Uh, as long as you are immersed it's impossible to have perspective and understand what is going on. Uh, it's like an experiment. When you have an experiment you have to isolate something and then see it with perspective. Uh, it's a little bit like that. Uh. So this is the uh, 
idea. This is one of the things that Venerable Nana Vimala realized, how heedless the whole world is. And he realized, I cannot afford that same kind of heedlessness. I don't want to be part of this. This is crazy. People are being stupid. I don't want to take part in this stupidity. But the other aspect of this is the burning building. Yeah? So the one thing is the heedlessness of the people. The other part is the burning building. Yeah? And the burning building here, it uh, symbolizes the impermanence of the world. Uh, yeah? Things are burning, things are ready to crash down at any time. Uh, things are always changing. Yeah? Things are impermanent, changing. We don't know what's going to happen next. Uh, before you know it, everything's come crashing down. Uh, and when it all comes crashing down, then you have a serious problem as a consequence. Uh, and uh, this is quite useful to reflect on this impermanence. First of all, I would like to say that the word impermanence is sometimes not all that useful because impermanence very often doesn't really touch you in a deep way. I don't know about you, to me impermanence is a bit wishy-washy kind of word. Yes, impermanence, but think of it more like unreliable, yeah? uncertain, things that let you down. Do you want to be let down in life? Well, this is life. Life lets you down. Yeah, we don't want things to be unreliable. We don't want things to let you down. But that is the nature of reality. Anicca means will let you down. But, uh, maybe, maybe not. Maybe it means something like that. Yeah, it can be translated like that. Because that is the outcome. That is what happens when you have Anicca. Things will eventually let you down. And uh, one way of thinking about this, which is very useful, start with the very simple things. Uh, start when you uh, read about the world, what is happening to the world around you. Maybe you're seeing the news on TV or you're reading something in the newspaper. Uh, yeah? And you start to look at the world around you. You start to look at things like the environment. Uh, you look at the wars in the world. You look at all the refugees all over the place. Uh, you look at the terrorist bombings happening. There was just a terrorist bombing recently, wasn't there, in, in New Zealand. Yeah, certainly 49 people dying. So it's happening everywhere. Huh? And when you see these things yeah, happening in the world, how do you react? Sometimes you might get a bit angry and upset. Why is this thing going on? It's not, you know, this is, I don't want it to be this way. Huh? But notice that feeling. Huh? When you notice that feeling that you don't want this to go on, huh? you expect or you hope for the world to be different, huh? That is where you are in denial of Anicca. You are in denial of the world being out of control. You are in denial of the world always letting you down at the end of the day. So, uh, and uh, then you, you expand this out. Yeah, you see this is true of the political world, it's true of the environment, it's true of all of these external things that often go wrong. Sometimes they go right, but sometimes they go wrong. The problem is that we have expectations that it should go in a certain way. We don't want to have war in Malaysia. Is that right? It's not nice to have war. Yeah, You don't want that, but who knows it's going to happen. It's impossible to predict yeah, down the line. Nobody wants to have war because war is so much suffering. And still these things happen. And when you see some of the politicians around the world, you wonder, you know, are they creating war, some of these politicians? You know, they are so belligerent and so kind of... Uh, uh, you know, they put down others and lift themselves up and say, yeah, we are the best, you know, we're going to sort everything out. And now you think, well, you know, what, what's going on here? There's no respect for anyone else. And there's kind of a, a nationalistic feeling and selfish ideas about, you know, I, we being the best and all these kind of things. It's like creating all the conditions for problems in the future. Yeah? And when you see all of that, if you think, oh no, this is wrong, uh, then uh, and you get angry about that or upset about that, uh, you know you have already not fully grasped the idea of impermanence, of anicca, of things being unreliable, things being literally out of control. Yeah? You are one person among seven billion. Uh, your ability to control the world is almost zero. Uh, the world will go according to its own cause and conditions. Uh, you do the little thing you can to be kind, to do the right things, uh, but in the end, the world is still going to go according to its, in its own way. Uh, and once you get this, uh, one of two things can happen. Sometimes people get depressed. Yeah? You watch the news too much and you start to get, get depressed or you get sad. And this is kind of a common thing and I often tell people, for goodness sake, don't watch the news so much. It's not going to make you happy. Yeah? Just turn off that blooming television. Don't go on the internet or whatever and don't watch these things because this makes you miserable sometimes. 
But that is kind of only a first step. Yeah, this is kind of only the first thing to do. Huh? But there is a more profound way of reacting to this. Huh? And the profound way of reacting to this is to actually really understand, really get uh, that the world is out of control. Huh? And when you really get that in a deep way, instead of getting sad and depressed about it, uh, you understand that actually I took my refuge in the wrong place. I took my refuge in the world. Expecting happiness from the world is like taking refuge in the world. I'm expecting happiness in the wrong place. I should look for happiness somewhere else. I should take refuge, go, come back. to the, This is why we have the Buddha Dhamma Sangha as a refuge, because this is where we ultimately then decide to find happiness. This is where real happiness is to be, disco to be discovered and to be found. So what it does, if you look at the world in the right way, it makes you turn away from those worldly phenomena because you know that they're out of control and turn inwards instead, inwards to your spiritual life, to uh, cultivating happiness in a different place. And that means taking refuge in the right place. That is the right conclusion, yeah? And the reason why it is the right conclusion, even though the external world is out of control, your inner world is something you can always have some degree of control over. You can do something with your inner life, whereas the external world, yeah, there's very little you can do about that. So this is the great conclusion, yeah? It makes you a different kind of person. It transforms you from someone who is always concerned about the external things of the world, things that will always let you down. Remember that, always let you down. It transforms you from that kind of person to someone who takes the spiritual aspects of life much more seriously. So this is the right way of dealing with this. And then you find a real refuge in your life. And this is the beauty of this. And it's not just when I talk about external things. It is not just what you see on television. Yeah? It is also what happens in our personal lives. Yeah? You look at your personal life, things are always unreliable, uncertain. Things are always going to let you down. Your friends are ultimately going to have to get sick and die. Your family members are going to have to get sick and die. Your own body is going to let you down eventually. Where is the cancer? Is the cancer already here? Maybe. Yeah. I have family members who are cancer, may, very quite possibly I already have some cancer. Actually, we probably all have cancer cells inside of us, just waiting to start to spread and kind of take over the body. The body is going to let you down. Yeah? Everything you own, all the things you own in the world, they are going to let you down. You're going to have to let go of those things eventually. The entire external world will let you down. And the way to summarize this is really just the five senses. The five senses is that external world. Uh, what you see, what you hear, what you taste, what you smell, and what you feel physically through touch. Uh, this is that external world. Uh, everything in that external world is going to be unreliable, going to let you down. There's only one place to turn. You have to turn inward, inside of yourself. Uh, and. Uh, this is what he discovered. This is what he saw when he saw this burning house coming, falling down. Yeah? When he saw, he saw the impermanence of the world, but he understood it in a very profound way. So actually, he had to go forth uh, and become a monk instead. So for him, it had a very powerful effect, probably because he had cultivated his mind in past lives. He was ready. He already had a very pure mind, a very bright mind already. So for a very small amount of people, maybe 0.1% of the population or whatever, it has this kind of impact. For the rest of us, we have to work a little bit more with it for it to actually have the same kind of impact. But the theory, the principles are the same. So how do you feel about this? Are you feeling worried now? Are you feeling scared? Are you feeling, oh no, I don't want to hear this. this I don't come to Dhamma talks for this. I want to come so I can live happily in my ordinary life. Yeah? This is too much. But this, we know it's the reality, yeah, everyone, every one of you here knows this is the truth. We know that, this is what life is like. So because you know it is true already, all I'm doing, I'm just kind of giving rise to your own wisdom that is already there. And then you can actually apply it in such a way that it makes a difference in your life. And what is interesting is that the Buddha spoke about this in exactly, pretty much in exactly the same terms. And there is a, one of the suttas that I will be having a look at later on today is the Mahapanibbana Sutta. You all know about the Mahapanibbana Sutta? Huh? Yeah? Yes? Yeah? 
Yeah, okay, good. If you, don't, if you don't know about it, it is the sutta that talks about the Buddha's passing away. It talks about his last journey from Rajagaha to Kushinara and all the things that happened on that journey. It's a very beautiful sutta. And uh, I have been teaching it in Perth at Buddha Society WA. And we have come to session number 12 or 13 or something. So it goes, it's not a sutta. One, this kind of sutta, you can't do it in one hour. You have to do it over you know, a long, long time because it's, there's so much to it. And uh, in that sutta, towards the end of it, uh, everyone becomes clear that the Buddha is about to pass away. Uh, the Buddha says, in three months from now I will pass away. Uh, and, every, and people start to despair. No, please don't pass away. Live on for the eon. That's what they ask him. Poor Buddha. They don't consider the Buddha. What, what is it like to live on for an eon? Imagine living for a whole eon. It must be terrible, especially with this kind of body. After a while, even after a hundred years, this body is pretty useless. Uh, imagine what it's like after an eon. No, please don't imagine that because it, it's not very, not very pretty. <laughs> so, uh, and they despair. Please don't pass away, because everyone understands when the Buddha passes away, what's going to happen to Buddhism? Yeah, it's all going to maybe fall apart, they rely on the Buddha for almost everything, it's going to make it very difficult. So, uh, then the Buddha tells them, but what have I been teaching you all along? I've been teaching you, everything that is dear and agreeable to you must become otherwise. This is what it means, yeah? everything in the external world, especially those things that we are attached to, uh, those things that are very meaningful to us, uh, all of those things must become, uh, must become otherwise, they must change. And the Buddha says to Ananda, but I've been teaching you this all along. Even Venerable Ananda, who is obviously very wise in many ways, uh, even he hasn't got that message fully. Uh, just like most people in the world haven't got that message fully, even though you've been a Buddhist for a long time, that message hasn't really sunk in fully. Huh? And then the Buddha says, uh, uh, the next thing he says, he says that uh, you should be islands unto yourself. Uh, you should take the Dhamma as your island. Huh? Yeah? Uh, and what that means, uh, and then he explains what that means. Just, well, first of all, taking the Dhamma as your island means that you have the teachings of the Buddha. You use those if you need advice on the path or what to do, how to live your life in the right way. That is where you seek advice. Uh, this is the first thing that he says. The second thing, being an island unto yourself, he explains that as practicing the four satipatthanas, practicing meditation. That's how he explains that. Why is that? And the reason for that is because when you practice meditation, if your meditation starts to come together and it works, then you find all that Meaning, you find the happiness, you find the joy, you find the peace, you find that beauty inside of yourself. If you watch, if you are able to do the mindfulness of breathing, and even if you can do it just a little bit, already it is helpful. But the more profoundly you can do that, the more you find a sense of independence within you, because you find all the happiness and all the meaning of the world with, right there within you here and now. Then you are an island unto yourself. Whatever happens in the external world, it may still affect you, but it affects you far less because you have a refuge within yourself where you can go, where you feel free of the external world. And you may think that this is unfair because meditating to this level, I can't meditate to this level, so what am I going to do? Well, you are already finding that refuge a little bit just by starting on the path. Yeah? Whenever you practice morality, kindness to others, generosity, whenever you think a thought of compassion towards other people, you are already practicing this to some extent. You are creating happiness inside of yourself because kindness to others is also kindness to yourself. You feel good about yourself. So all you really have to do yeah, even if your meditation may not be the most profound, uh, even if you're not an arahant yet. Uh. <laughs> it takes a while to become an arahant. Uh. Even if you're not an arahant yet, uh, yeah, you, are, you can do something, you can start out on that path, uh, and you can do enough to start to create that island inside of yourself. Uh, and that is what you're doing. Uh. So start off with the right view. Then the right aim comes into existence. You start to want to live morally and live well. And because you understand the importance of this, you really put in a lot of effort, not effort, a lot of heedfulness, a lot of awareness into being kind, thinking the right thoughts, having compassion, having kindness to the people around you. 
Yeah, that is where you, this becomes the meaning for you. This becomes what is meaningful. All the other things in the world, okay, you've got to do them, but you're going to do them with the right attitude. You're going to do them in the right way. You're going to do the how of life in the right way. And then uh, the what's of life are not so important. The how means the heart quality you put into all the ordinary activities that you have to do anyway. And then you are on the right track. The more you understand the importance of this, the easier it is for you to remember this in ordinary life. Why? Because you understand this really matters. Yeah, it is like some, as if there's something very important in your mind that you know that you have to do within the next two days. You can't get it out of your mind because it's so important. Yeah? You have to give an important speech at a large conference with 2,000 people and the president of, the, of, uh, you know, of whatever country is going to be there and listen to you. And you can't get it out of your mind because it's so important to you. In the same way, you can't get out of your mind the importance of sila because it is so important to you. You reflect on the world in the right way. You understand where happiness really is to be found. And then it becomes impossible almost to forget it. This is how right view leads to apamada. Samaditi leads to heedfulness, carefulness, circumspection. Uh, understanding what is right from moment to moment and then gradually, gradually, gradually your life is transformed as a consequence. So this is what happens. Uh, yeah, have you, have you seen that happening a little bit in your own life? You, probably you have seen it happening a little bit. Yeah, you can see how this right view actually starts to affect how you live and, and how you do things. Uh, uh, there was one thing at the very beginning that I probably should have mentioned at the very start, it comes back to my mind now, about why and how right view is so significant. Uh, yeah, and one of the things that I didn't mention was that uh, right view obviously comes from the Buddha. Yeah, and this is why the Buddha is so important and the Dhamma is so important, because uh, the Buddha is called the eye of the world. Uh, yeah, it's one of the epithets of the Buddha, one of his, the way he is described. Uh, and the reason he's called the eye of the world is because he has that insight into these things. Uh, he is standing on that mountain. He already has that overview. Uh, he has seen what other people have not seen. Uh, and because of that, uh, he has the ability to give us access to that right view uh, without necessarily, and, and, and we can initially just take it on board on faith. Uh, and this is why when very often you see, read the suttas, uh, the suttas very often start off with the Kalyanamitta. The Kalyanamitta is the good spiritual friend, uh, yeah? And the number one Kalyanamitta in the world is the Buddha. So take the Buddha as your Kalyanamitta. How do you do that? By reading the sutta, by reading his words. That's how you take the Buddha as the Kalyanamitta. So take an interest in the Buddhist teachings. Because the Buddhist teaching, the things that I have been saying today, really, I've just been trying to quote from the suttas, really, with a little bit of elaboration, maybe quite a bit of elaboration, actually. But uh, basically, these are themes that you find in the suttas. Yeah? The Buddha talks like this. So if you read the suttas in the right way, if you think about in them in the right way, they will be this right view. Everything in the suttas, all the uh, six, five, six, seven thousand pages, whatever it is, all that, what it is, it's just one big block of right view. That's all it is. Yeah, so when you read that, what you do is you allow right view to soak into you. So by hanging out with the Buddha, yeah, hang out with the Buddha, by reading the suttas, by doing that, you get right view gradually soaking into you. And this is the point of Kalyanamitta. So remember the Buddha is your number one Kalyanamitta, and this is how right view gradually happens. And then you start on this path, and you kind of gradually uh, head in the right direction. Yeah, and that's why when I, I think it is my main job as a monastic is to actually teach the word of the Buddha, teach the suttas. When I teach a retreat anywhere, and these days I seem to be traveling a lot, uh, teaching retreats here and there, which actually is very nice, but I always like to teach from the suttas. And what I have found is that when I teach from the suttas, people love it. People can't get enough of it. Yeah, you get invited back. Even though I'm just kind of an ordinary monk, yeah, I'm not like Ajahn Brahm or Ajahn Shah or anything like that. I'm just this ordinary monk. People say, please come back. Even here in BGF, every year they ask me to come back. And then they, they say the same thing in Indonesia, in Sri Lanka, in Hong Kong, in Singapore, in Europe, everywhere. Please come back. And people get really inspired by it. There's something about the word of the Buddha that is so 
powerful, yeah? And especially if you get it explained maybe by someone who has a little bit of extra understanding, then it becomes really, really beautiful and really nice. Uh, so this is my job, I feel, as a Buddhist monk, to teach this, uh, to help people get access to that right view. Uh. So, um, uh, there is much more to say about right view. Uh, where is the boss? Bobby? <laughs> shall I continue or shall I stop here? Huh? Continue? Huh? 11, sorry? Huh? I can continue till 11.30? Huh? <laughs> <laughs> Gee, yeah. <laughs> Two hour Dhamma talk, yeah, that's really, okay. <laughs> Okay, I will, I will continue a little bit. I will continue a little bit more then. <laughs> we can do a bit of Q&A at the end. But I will, I will, so now I have talked about impermanence, yeah? And to understand impermanence in the right way, yeah, that is one aspect of right view. But there are other factors of right view. And one of those other factors is non-self. And I want to give you some idea how to think about non-self also from a point of right view. Yeah? Uh, because... Um, uh, many people say non-self is like a very theoretical thing, yeah, we can't really, we don't know how to apply it to our ordinary life. And fair, I think that's a pretty fair comment, yeah, it's hard to really know how to apply this sometimes. But I will show you how you can apply the idea of non-self to your ordinary life. And actually, it, this is a very, another very useful way of allowing right view to become, make you a better person as a consequence. And here I just want to tell another story. This is a story, another of those uh, stories in the suttas. Uh, and this is a story found in the middle length sayings. That it's called the Punavada Sutta. And a monk called Punna. Uh, and he went to the Buddha. And he goes to the Buddha. And monks and nuns would often do this. And they would say to the Buddha, please give me a teaching in brief. Uh, so that I can go and be in seclusion uh, and practice accordingly and then become an arahant. Yeah, they would say something like that. They wouldn't say become an Aran, but they would say just go and practice in seclusion. And so the Buddha gives him a brief, a teaching in brief, brief. And uh, this teaching is like a, you know fairly ordinary teaching of not having sensual desire, but you know finding happiness elsewhere. And then after the Buddha has given him this teaching, he says to Punna, he says, "Well, what are you going to do now?" <laughs> And Puna says, well, I plan to go to the, uh, the Suna Paranta country. And the Buddha says, Suna Paranta country? That's like the Wild West. <laughs> That's like far away. The people there are really fierce and really difficult and really wild. Are you sure you want to go to the Suna Paranta country? It was like Suna Paranta means like, Suna means like dog. And Aparanta means like the West. So it's like the Western dog, con dog country here. You want to go and live in the Western dog country? Are you sure that's, that's wise? And it's interesting, yeah? You, uh, if you look at uh, India in those days, the kind of the, what was considered the civilized area of India was around the Ganges plain. That's where you had the biggest cities. That's where you had the most famous wanderers and religions and all of these kind of things. They would consider themselves civilized. And as soon as you were outside of that area, you were considered like barbarians, yeah? It's always been like that. Yeah? Every civilization has considered their culture as the civilization. Everyone outside, they were barbarians. So that's kind of human history. We tend to be insular. We tend to look at our own life like that. And this was exactly the same thing in India. And you can see this in the suttas, how these uh, uh, faraway places were considered like wildernesses. And this is actually explained. As you see that in a number of places. And it's exactly the same thing here. And so... Uh, how are you going to survive? What are you going to do when these people, yeah, these people are really rough and really kind of harsh to deal with, when they start insulting you and abusing you, yeah, we know that's going to happen, what's the, what's, what are you going to do? And then Puna says, well, if they really insult and abuse me, then I'm going to say, oh, thank you so much for not hitting me with the palm of your hand. <laughs> it's quite nice. Isn't that, isn't that kind of beautiful? It's, it's such a... It's such a uplifting way, it's being so positive, yeah, if someone, if, so next time you go down the street in KL and somebody abuses you, oh, thank you so much for not hitting me, oh, sadu, sadu, sadu. 
It's a great way of thinking about things. Yeah? It could have been worse. Yeah? It could have been much worse. Uh, it's how to keep a positive mind in a, in a, a, in when something is difficult. In a, and uh, so, uh, there's actually another story about it. There's another of Ajahn Brahm stories. I, I don't know if all of these Ajahn Brahm stories are true or not, to be honest, but uh, <laughs> it prob probably is true, actually. It, there's always some truth to these stories, and that is the important thing. And this was a story of, uh, from ancient Greece. In ancient Greece, there was this teacher and he had a large number of students. I don't know why he had a large number of students, because he was a very strange teacher. And he would abuse his students all, all the time, yeah? And he would, uh, and, uh, uh, and every time he abused his students, the students had to pay him because they abused him. <laughs> what, can, what kind of teacher is that? <laughs> so I don't know how he got students, because it sounds like almost impossible to get students if you're that kind of teacher. But anyway, he got all these students, uh, and then uh, after they graduated, uh, they must have learned something useful. Uh, uh, then uh, when they went into town yeah, and people abused them, uh, they started to laugh. <laughs> Why? And then they asked them, how come you're laughing? Because he's abusing me and I don't have to pay anything here. <laughs> <laughs> so this, this, this teacher, he prepared them for the real life. Yeah, now you can deal with abuse in a way. And it's exactly the same thing with this punna. When he went out there, oh, he said, thank you so much for not hitting me w with the palm of your hand. And then the Buddha says to him, but what if they do hit you with the palm of the hand? Yeah? What, what if that actually happens? Well, then I will say, thank you so much for not throwing a stone at me. And the Buddha said, what if they throw a stone at you? Well, then I will say, thank you so much for not beating me up with sticks. But what if they do beat you up with sticks? This is a really rough place, yeah, so this, this could happen. I will say, thank you so much for not stabbing me with a knife. What if they do stab you with a knife? <laughs> do you know where this is going? <laughs> it's interesting, yeah, we don't know where this is going. Yeah? Unless you have read the sutta. What if they do stab you with a knife? I will say, thank you so much for not killing me with a knife. What if they do kill you with a knife? What are you going to do then? Then I will say, there are other people in this world who look for people to kill them, yeah? I didn't have to look for anyone, it came by itself. <laughs> <laughs> so this is like pos taking positive ideas to the maximum, yeah? To the absolute maximum. And uh, if you die, and Puna, he probably was, he must have been quite developed already. He probably wasn't an arahant yet, but he was probably very developed. Uh, actually, death is not such a big deal. Is that right? <laughs> death doesn't matter so much. Death is, not, death is not the most important thing in the world, and that's true. It is true from a Buddhist point of view, because if you do live well, if you do the right thing, that is what really matters. Uh, if you do live well, then things go well for you in this life, things also go well for you in the future life. De death is part of life, we can't avoid death anyway. Death is not really the big problem, the big problem is how we live. Yeah, death is just another transition, just like all the transitions in life, you get married, you, you kind of get divorced, you, you get, a degree, <laughs> get a degree or whatever it is, yeah, all of these transitions in life. Death is just another one of those. It's a bit more serious than the other transitions, but it's really just that. If you live well, that is what really matters. Death is just part and parcel of things. This is how you look at it, yeah? Especially if you are a noble one, you understand what actually matters in this world. You don't really have any fear of death anymore. Death is not a big problem. So, um, this is very interesting, because how is it possible to have such a positive view? Could you do that? It sounds almost outrageous. Yeah, how can you think like that? It's a little bit like the famous simile of the saw. You know the simile of the saw? Anyone does not know the simile of the saw? Don't know the simile of the saw? Okay, one person doesn't know the simile. Another one doesn't know it? No? Don't know the simile. Okay, I'll tell you the simile of the saw because it's very important and it's a very fundamental idea in the Buddhist teachings about, you know, when it's, it's quoted elsewhere in the suttas. So it's actually quite an important one. But it's one of those things that when you read it you think it's impossible and you kind of skip it and you never think about it again. But actually it is not impossible, and that's the point. Uh, and the simile of the saw is where the Buddha says to his monks that uh, uh, even if bandits come and grab you uh, and they put you down on the ground and they pin you down, they hold you down, they take a two-handled saw, 
Yet they didn't have chainsaws in those days. They had two-handle saws with big rusty blades and <laughs> pulled back and forth. And they take you and they cut you apart with a two-handle saw, limb by limb. First the arm, then the legs, then maybe the head. Yeah, One thing after the other. Even as those bandits are cutting you apart, limb by limb in that way, if you have a thought of anger against those bandits, you're not practicing my teaching. You should have, even while they're cutting you apart, you should have compassion for them. You should have metta towards these bandits as you do that. And this is why people, when they read that, they say, oh yeah, sounds very nice, next sutta, next sutta, please. <laughs> because you don't understand, how is this possible? Yeah, it is, nobody can do that. Everyone gets angry in that kind of situation, you get upset. But it is not impossible, that's the whole point. So the question is, how is it possible? And this is similar to the Punavada Sutta. How is it possible to think like Puna? Well, if they kill me, I would just think, well, other people had to look for an assassin, I didn't even have to look for anyone, yeah? Good. How is it possible? And the re way it is possible uh, is to understand the idea of anatta, of non-self, in a profound way. Non-self means that as human beings we have very little inner say on what we are as human beings. Yeah, the way we are as human beings is because of cause and conditions in our life. If there is no permanent core to us, if there is no essence to who we are, this is what anatta means, non-self, there is no essence inside of us. It means that everything we are are all these changeable phenomena. And, this, and if you look at your mind and body, you know that's basically true. Yeah, your mind is always changing, the body is always changing. Yeah. So you have some idea that that is true, but not fully. Because we are all these changeable phenomena, and these changeable phenomena, they exist in the causal uh, nexus, or causal network, yeah, with other things. That what we are mentally, what we are physically, is a result of all these, all these other cause and conditions. We have a certain mother and father, we were brought up in a certain way, we went to a certain school, we had certain friends. And then we had certain past lives. Yeah? Those past lives also come into this in the Buddhist thing. And all those things together, they make us what we are now. So in other, in other words, you can't be anything else except for what you are. Yeah? Except for the way you feel now, except for your intentions or what you are. You have to be that way. Yeah? There is no choice in the matter because these things have been caused into existence by other things that make them actually appear. So this is the idea of non-self. There is very little free will. We can assume, for the, uh, just for the argument, that there is no free will at all. We can assume that, because whatever free will there is, if there is any, uh, it's so small, it doesn't really matter. So let's assume that there is no free will. That's what I always assume when I look at other people, when I look at myself. I assume no free will. Well, if there is no free will, how can you really hold people responsible, ultimately, for what they do? You can't really hold people responsible, yeah? If they are doing, just playing out their inner conditioning, yeah? playing out the causes from the past. If some suicide, if some crazy bomber kills 49 people in Christchurch in New Zealand, yeah? if some other bomber, bom bomber kills people, it doesn't, it doesn't, suicide bombings happening around the world, you know, every now and again. Yeah? Why do they do that? Because they have been caused and conditioned to do that. They have been brainwashed in a bad way. And they don't really have much choice in the matter. Of course, according to our legal system, you are responsible. So according to the legal system, you then have to go to jail. That's probably a good thing that they go to jail, because otherwise they might do more bombings. So sometimes we have to put people in jail just to save us from having more dead people. Yeah, we don't want to be the next on the list. So we better if you go to jail. But. Uh, uh, in, from a Buddhist point of view, not really. From a Buddhist point of view, we should have compassion. Of course, we have compassion for the victims. This is by far the most important one. But that is the easy part. Everyone can have compassion for the victims. Because we can see how much suffering there is in having your family, etc., destroyed by this. But the person who, who did the bombing, the natural thing is to be angry with someone like that, to get really upset. Why are you doing this? You must be crazy. What, 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 aren't you thinking properly? And of course, that's the whole point. They are not thinking properly because they have been conditioned in the wrong way and they are incapable of thinking in the right way. That's why they do this. 
So in a sense, when someone does something crazy like that, you have to have compassion for them. You know, <laughs> you are so blind, you are so crazy, you are so deluded that you go out killing 49 people. This person thinks that they're doing something good. If you read some of what these people say about why they do these things, they think they are helping the world because they think that Muslims are, you know, Islam is dangerous or whatever. So they think that they have to sort of, you know, stop Islam from kind of, you know, doing whatever it is doing. It's just there peacefully in New Zealand. It's not a big problem. And so they kill people. They think they're doing something good in the world. They think they're creating happiness for themselves and for others. But actually what they're doing is the exact opposite. And the person they are hurting more than anyone is themselves. Imagine after a while how you feel about yourself if you kill 49 people in one go. Has anyone here ever killed anyone? <laughs> <laughs> it's very difficult to kill another human being, yeah? When you are there and you have a gun in your hand and you have to kill someone, it's very, very difficult because it goes against the grain. It's an incredibly difficult psychological barrier to pass, to be able to kill somebody. So, for someone who does that, they are so self-destructive. They are destroying their own future, both here and now and also in future lives. The consequences are tremendous. They think they are creating happiness for themselves and others, while in reality they are creating enormous amounts of suffering, especially for themselves. And when you start to see this, you start to feel Compassion for everyone, because you understand it's all out of control. We are wandering around in darkness, not understanding where real happiness is. And it's kind of sad, yeah, sad in a very deep way. And then you start to have compassion for the world, because how blind we are, how much we're working, walking around in darkness. And you start to be a bit worried, because we know we have a little bit of that darkness inside of ourselves as well. Yeah. So you get a bit concerned about that. And then you start to understand, I need to get out of this darkness and find as much light and much understanding standing as much wisdom, as much right view as I possibly can within myself to avoid similar things happening in the future. So this is how you use non-self. When you see non-self in a deep way, you can have compassion for other people because you start to understand they are not really in charge of themselves. Yeah? This is the right way. When you see the whole of the rest of the world condemning some people for doing what is wrong, saying this is evil, Please don't be like everyone else. Don't think like all the ordinary people in the world. You should remember there's no such thing as evil. There's only conditioning. People have been conditioned to do bad things. But evil is almost like you're stamping someone as permanently bad. But there's no such thing in the world. Everything is just cause and conditions. So in this way, you can start to have compassion for everyone. You can have compassion for your own abusers. You can have compassion for the people who saw you apart with a two-handled saw. This is how you do it. When, you, when they cut you apart with a two-handled saw, you think you don't know what you're doing. You're creating so much bad karma for yourself. I'm a good Buddhist. I'm living my life well. You are cutting me apart for no reason at all. You have no idea what you're doing to yourself. Yeah, you, okay, it is painful to be cut apart from a with a two-handed saw, so you have to endure a bit of pain, yeah? Maybe a lot of pain. <laughs> but, uh, but you will be dead in a few minutes, yeah? Because the blood, you will just bleed like crazy, and within a few minutes you will be dead. And then because you are a good Buddhist, you get reborn in a nice place, yeah? So no problem. So for you it's no problem, yeah? No need to get angry. The problem is for those people who are cutting you apart. They are the ones who have the real problem, because they are stuck in delusion, stuck in darkness, uh, and moving on like that for a long, long, long time in the future. Uh, whereas you, and especially if you are able to have compassion and metta for people like that, uh, when they cut you apart, wow, you're going to go to a good destination afterwards, yeah? <laughs> Super good destination afterwards, uh, especially if you do that. Uh, this is how you do it. Uh, it is not impossible. You start with baby steps. You start now, gradually learning how to look at the world in this way. Yeah? Not just looking at it in this way, because if all you do is look at it in this way with compassion, sometimes you can become a bit sad that there is so much suffering in the world. 
always remember to balance this. We're looking at all the goodness in the world. What a wonderful thing that people come together here at the BGF, listening to the Dhamma, trying to live better lives. It's a wonderful thing. Yeah? You should be so thankful that you have Kalyanamittas here at the BGF, here in KL, overseas, everywhere. There's a lot of goodness in the world. Don't forget that. But when you see badness, learn to forgive. And this is using non-self, using right view to forgive. These are very important teachings. Yeah, I'm not saying these things because, uh, you know, just as a nice theoretical thing. These are very practical things that if you use this, you apply this in your daily life, it will gradually transform you. I have been doing these things for, I've been a monk for 23 years, something like that. I've been applying these things uh, regularly. I know that they work. I have no doubt that these things work. It's just a matter of gradually, gradually getting there. And then one day you will be ready for the two-handled saw. <laughs> then we will test you. We will put you down over here and we will see, if it <laughs> see what happens. That would, be, that would be something, yeah? Maybe I should be the one who is tested. Oh, okay, no test. Okay, no. <laughs> I don't think we may, we may just forget about that whole testing business. <laughs> anyway, there is so much more to say about right view, but I think, I think that is enough. I've been talking for over an hour already. I don't want to talk too much, but uh, you, I would like to give everyone a chance to ask some questions and discuss a little bit, if you'd like to do that. So, please, Bobby. here. Put your hands up for the mic. Hi. Um, my question might seem quite basic. You, you mentioned uh, when you're immersed in something, you cannot get perspective. And I guess in layman terms, if you are ruminating about something constantly, you can't get perspective. Is that what you mean? And, and I guess what's yeah. the science behind? Yeah, I, well, yeah, there, are, there are many ways that you can be immersed in things. There are many different kinds of immersion, and one of those is the ruminating. That's one kind of immersion. You are immersed in your thoughts, immersed in worries and anxieties, and because you're trying to solve all the problems in life, but life is always full of problems. So that is one kind of immersion. And what you will find generally is that if you are able to withdraw from all those thinking and just calm your mind down and be peaceful, very often the solutions tend to come then. Very often when you think about things, you just go around in circles. Yeah? Think about the same thing again and again and again. And every time you think you will find a solution, but every time you don't. Uh, very often when you just stop a little bit, uh, bang, suddenly it comes to you. Okay, now I know what I have to do. Uh, it's often the not thinking is actually more powerful than the thinking here. But what I, was, uh, what I had in mind when I was talking about that was more just the fact that in our life we tend to be immersed in this world. Yeah, right now we are, in a sense, immersed in this world. We see things, we hear things, we feel things. This is the sense of the world of the five senses. It is pretty much all we know. And uh, sometimes we get a bit of a shock in that world of the five senses. Sometimes, you know, something very personal happens to you. Uh, like, uh, you know, a few years ago, my sister got cancer. Uh, and then suddenly it's like a shock to the system. And you realize that, the, you know, the, this sensory world is not, is not, there is problems with it. Uh, and those problems with the sensory world, they give you a bit of perspective. Uh, they make you step back a little bit and ask, is there somewhere else that the happiness is more reliable, is more useful than in the realm where obviously there is a lot of problems, a lot of suffering. A realm that will always let you down in the end is not, cannot be a satisfactory realm. It will always be problematic. So look somewhere else. That's what I had in, had in mind about that. And eventually one day you kind of emerge completely from that being trapped in the sensory realm. Absolutely. Everything is... Yeah. Oh, yes, yeah. Life, life is always about escaping here. Yeah? Everything in life is about escaping here. If you, uh, you know, in the morning, when, whenever we make a choice in life, uh, we want to escape from the unpleasant and, uh, and move to the pleasant. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Are you married? Uh, no, not married. Okay. Well, if, if anyone who is married, uh, yeah, or, or maybe you are you looking to get married, maybe? I don't know. But <laughs> <laughs> if, if you are to choose a, a partner in life, yeah? How do you choose, you probably understand this even though you're not married, if you are to choose a partner in life, 
Would you choose someone you hate or would you choose someone you like? Well, you want to escape from, from the bad consequences of choosing someone you hate. Yeah? So you choose someone you like. That's already escape. Everything in life is about escape. We're trying to escape from suffering, trying to escape from unpleasant feelings, trying to escape from depression and sorrow. There's nothing wrong with escape. When escape becomes bad is if it becomes some kind of psychological mechanism. We don't want to look at reality. That's when it becomes bad. But escape is a good thing because that is actually what we all want in life. I would, at the very deepest level, uh, we want satisfaction, we want contentment, we want to be happy. Everybody is like that. This is the basic driving force that drives us in life. This is why we do things. Any act that we do is driven by this desire to move towards more happiness and, and contentment and away from suffering. Yeah. So escape, you need to define the term carefully here. Yeah, and to make, uh, once you define it, in the right way. There are some escapes that are bad, where you try to block out the world, you don't want to see reality, but other escapes that are perfectly acceptable. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> right thought and right view. <laughs> okay, so uh, the uh, well, right right view is includes kind of right thought in many ways, yeah. Because when you uh, when you have right view, you tend to think in the right way, yeah? and this is one of the reasons why from samadhi you have samma sankapa. Uh, samma sankapa is sometimes translated as right thought, uh, because uh, thinking and intention are often very closely uh, related to each other, yeah. So um, uh, when you have right view, the thinking tends to be more aligned with that reality. But right view is more than that. Right view has to do with our perceptions, how we perceive things. In other words, how you look at things, yeah? your ideas, your world view, your values. All of these things are included in right view. So for example, if you view the sensory realm as unsatisfactory, as problematic, yeah, then your values move more towards maybe the spiritual life, uh, towards spiritual things. Uh, that becomes encompassed within right view. Uh, and that is more like a perception or an idea, not necessarily something you think about, uh, but something that is, is lodged on a, more, on a deeper level in your life. Uh, so if someone asks you, what is your view about this? Uh, it is something that is always there, but you don't always think about it. Uh, if some, someone asks you, "But what is your view about uh, uh, whatever about you know a, a religion or about whatever?" You, maybe you may have an opinion about it. Uh, it's not always in your mind, uh, but it's something that is a part of you that kind of is uh, that um, uh, is always there in a sense under the surface, and that is kind of the idea of view. It is uh, something that is lodged inside of you uh, as a, as an outlook how to look at the world. Uh. Am I making any sense? Yeah. <laughs> so, so if if someone asks you which, what politicians do you support, yeah, you have a view about that already. Yeah. Well, the right thought is just a particular expression of right view. Huh? So, uh, so for example, if you uh, if someone asks you what is what is your what is your view about something, huh? yeah, then you will express that through thinking and speaking about it. Huh? Yeah? But the view is at a deeper level, it's already there. But the thought then just arises at a particular time because you're thinking about it. Uh. And that thought will often be related to purpose and intention and aim. So that's why it is sometimes called Samma Sankapa as, as well. Yeah. yeah, sure. Let's I sometimes think right view comes before value. Sometimes I think value determines right view. So, so which is which now? I mean, which comes first? Really? What comes first? I think, uh, I think right view is often the most basic one. Uh, um, but you, because once you, you know, what 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 is a value? A value is kind of the things that make us act in the world. What what is important to us? What what we value is kind of what values are about. Uh, so uh, you know your. Um, your values might be, you know, maybe in one sense they could be said to be your values are uh, to be kind or, or whatever, you want to live with a kindness or whatever. Now that, that 
a desire to be kind, to live in a spiritual way, comes from the way you look at the world. Because you realize, well, this actually will probably give me happiness, it will give other people happiness, it will make life more meaningful. That's why you're kind. So in that sense, I would say right view is, is, uh, is kind of probably more fundamental than right values. Uh, and then the values come out of that. So once you think about the world in a certain way, the values will tend to come uh, accordingly. That's the way I would look at it. But it's possible that you can invert it as well. Values will have some effect on your view, probably. I guess it all depends on how you define these things and what you mean by them. But uh, view is, I think, the most uh, basic thing usually. If you read the, you know, some of the things that you find in the suttas, where the Buddha talks about these things, he talks about some of the most uh, basic principles that uh, are at the very root of our practice of the Dhamma. And one of those things that are at the root of everything uh, is right view. Uh. Another one is uh, uh, Kalyanamitta, good spiritual friendship, uh, is another one, because that is very closely related to right view. Uh. Another one is Apamada, which is heedlessness. Uh. Yeah, because uh, right view and heedlessness obviously also very closely related to each other. If you are a heedless, if you are a heedful person, uh, if you are careful in your life, uh, you will tend to have more right view. Uh. Why is that? Because you think about things properly, you reflect about them, you look at the world with more care, and then right view comes. Uh. Because you have right view, you will be more heedful. Uh. Yeah, because when you have right view, uh, you understand that being careful about things, being circumspect, is important. Uh, you can't just allow the kind of things to roll on their own. Uh. So the two things are almost like pillars that support each other. It's very hard to say, in this case, what comes first, whether heedfulness comes first or right view comes first, because they are so closely linked to each other, almost as if there are aspects of uh, one bigger entity, in a sense. Uh, that's how it seems to me here. Yeah. Okay, here. Yeah. Good morning, yeah. Uh, you were saying no free will. Uh, uh, yes, I was saying that, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Does that equate to determinism? Aha. <laughs> um, does, it, does, it, does it equate to uh, fatalism or determinism? I'm just stretching my legs a little bit. Hope you don't mind. Um, uh, not really. Uh, well, it, it's, it depends what we mean by fatalism. Yeah? These things are very complicated concepts, and I, I'm always afraid of getting too philosophical because you, you end up kind of uh, just talking philosophy rather than practical things. But uh, uh, one of the things about fatalism, the way it is often uh, regarded, is that uh, what we do in the world doesn't matter. Uh, yeah? How we act is not important uh, because the world is kind of moving towards a certain uh, outcome anyway, and we don't have any input in that outcome. Uh, but that is not what Buddhism is saying. Uh, Buddhism is saying is how we live matters. Uh, yeah? So if you live in the right way, if you live with wisdom, uh, if you act in a certain way, uh, that will actually have an impact on the outcomes in your life. Uh, so if you have good intentions, uh, you will be heading towards more happiness. Uh, if you have bad intentions, uh, you will he head towards more suffering. So you try to control those intentions. Uh, you try to live well, you try to do the right thing, because you know doing the right thing will have an impact. Uh, but where does that intention come from? Uh, yeah? Where does the right view come from? Where does that desire to live in the right way, where, where does that arise from? And of course it arises from, in part, because you are a Buddhist. Yeah? Are you a Buddhist? Uh? Yeah? <laughs> I better check first of all, you never know what people are. So, uh, it arises because you are a Buddhist. Uh, yeah, so because you are a Buddhist, then you think in a certain way, you listen to the Buddhist teachings, uh, and that has an impact on you. That makes you do certain things. Yeah? So it, it is, in a way, it is, uh, that's why when I first came to Bodhinyana Monastery, and Ajahn Brahm says, you know, well, you know, I'm going to brainwash you. Uh, I thought, no way, I'm not going to allow myself to be brainwashed. There's absolutely no way. I'm going to think for myself. And this is what everybody wants to do. They want to think for ourselves. But really, uh, if there is no free will, we are getting brainwashed. So what you have to do is you have to choose the right kind of brainwashing. Yeah. That's really what it comes down to. Huh? What kind of brainwashing are you going to get? Huh? The good one or the bad one? Huh? It's a bit of an echo, is that right? Huh? Can you hear the bad sound? Huh? I wonder whether we can improve it or not. Huh? Um, 
So this is what it comes down to. But in practice, it doesn't matter all that much. That's better. Huh? It doesn't matter all that much because uh, for each one of us, it feels as if we have uh, free will. Huh? It feels as if we make choices. Yeah, you feel like you can choose to food A or food B. Huh? It doesn't f you don't feel like the robot, you have to choose food A. Yeah? You feel like you can choose it. So you go with that feeling, yeah? and you use that feeling to make good choices in your life. Uh, that's really what matters. Uh, and then down the line, maybe you will have the insight or understanding that the, you know, when there is no self, really, this was a big illusion, the idea that I was making a free choice. Actually, I was just conditioned. Yeah? I like this. I don't, what do you have for breakfast? I don't know what you have for breakfast. It doesn't matter. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but whatever you have for breakfast, very likely it is also conditioned by your background. Yeah? You grew up with a certain kind of breakfast. You, 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 know, you, you eat in a certain way. You know, I don't know what Ajahn Brahm, he's kind of the classic, he likes the classic English food. Yeah? Uh, you know, uh, fish, and, fish and chips, that kind of stuff. Uh, that's because he was born, born in England. Yeah? If you're born in Malaysia, you probably like other food. If you're born in Sri Lanka, it's different. If you're born in Norway, well, you like, like you know, I don't know. I don't know what you like. <laughs> I haven't lived in Norway all that much, but uh, so, so you you know you are you are influenced by the conditions around you, and that influence is very powerful. And the more you investigate that, the more you will actually start to realize that if there is any free will at all, there isn't much. Uh, and the more deeply you investigate it, uh, the more powerful you will see how influenced you are by all the causing conditions around you. Uh. And this, uh, don't, so don't worry too much about it, whether it's true or not. Uh. Just go with the feeling that you have, that you have free will, make the best choices you possibly can, uh, and then down the track you will hopefully get some real insight into, into these things. Uh. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, Sama Diti. The Diti word is like seeing, isn't it? Yeah. Diti is in seeing. Exactly, yes. So it's yeah. related to Jnana Dasana, where Dasana also means yes. seeing. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> Benefits of studying. <laughs> okay. Very good. Yes, it's, it's related to each other. These are from the same root, the same verbal root, uh, and they both mean seeing. Yeah, that's exactly right. Uh, yes, Joy. John, <laughs> um, yeah. on, um, becoming a good friend with Buddha by reading suttas, I only want to book on my bedside table, which is a small stop that I got from one of the monasteries. Okay. And I noticed when yeah. I can surely fall asleep by reading the sutta book. And I noticed the night only me, even uh, my husband, who is an uh, English speaker, yeah. do the same for a slave. Right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I thought yeah. this is because um, that is written, well translated in a way that is repetitive and can be quite cryptic. He sees, but he does not see. <laughs> it was like very unfamiliar. Uh, knowledge is like yeah. material attainment and all that. Yeah. I mean, this, I know it's good because it makes me kind of like confused and therefore um, curious yeah. not to dig in. But when it's too difficult, I mean, one could easily give up. Yeah, so, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, can you take a middle way um, on super <laughs> translation so that it can be a bit easier to read for everyone? I mean, like myself, at least outside this room, I guess we are the majority. Yeah. So, um, like okay, so you, you fall asleep when you <laughs> read the sutta. So. Well, maybe, maybe because you have the sutta on your bedside table. Yeah? Maybe it's, the, it's the wrong place to have the sutta. Yeah? You <laughs> put the sutta somewhere else. <laughs> no, I, I'm being... Uh, so, well, it, yeah, it can be a problem. It can be difficult. The suttas can be, as you say, repetitive, and they can seem kind of uh, boring or whatever. So it is a, it is a particular... Um, you have to kind of learn almost to read them. And one of the ways of doing that is to start off by listening to people doing sutta readings. And this is one of the reasons why I like to explain the suttas, because I actually find it inspiring. Just, just reading it for others, I find it quite inspiring, you know, you, because you think about it in a new way. And it gives you this, uh, you know, one of the things that Buddha says is that when you teach other people, you also can get joy and happiness from that. The listeners can get joy. It's kind of a win-win situation. So listen to other people who actually do pseudo readings uh, and see if that... I, I haven't seen you fall asleep upstairs uh, so far. Uh, so, 
so as, you had to fight you had to fight the urge to sleep. <laughs> That's a bad sign, isn't it? <laughs> so um, so but so try that instead. Start with that. Uh, it it doesn't matter. You can also you know if if you if you prefer to listen to dhamma talks and you have some teachers that you feel are giving you real dhamma, the proper thing, you can listen to that as well. It doesn't have to be just the Buddha. You can also listen to dhamma talks. But I think it's important to realize that. Uh, at the end of the day, the real Dhamma is, uh, the, the realist Dhamma, I should say, uh, is the word of the Buddha. He's the one who started all of this. Yeah? The Buddha had to get it right. If the Buddha didn't get it right, uh, whatever else we have in this world is, is nonsense. Yeah? Because everything else is built upon the word of the Buddha. So everything else kind of collapses. Uh, so the w we have to assume the Buddha got it right. So that is where real Dhamma has to be found. Everything else might be dodgy, but the, real, but the word of the Buddha has to kind of be right by definition almost. Uh, so try to balance it a little bit. Yeah? If you find that the sutta bores you to sleep, uh, skip it. Go to the next one. Yeah? Well, if that one also boring, go to the next one. If that is boring, go to the next one. And keep on going. And after, maybe you only find one sutta in the whole collection that inspires you. So read the one that inspires you. Huh? Occasionally, you will find similes. Uh, you will find little stories. You will find little metaphors that you, find that you actually will find really inspiring. I'm sure that has happened to you. Has it happened to you? Huh? Yeah. I, uh, that's the one. That's the one you like. Okay, it's like a Zen, a Zen koan. It's like a Zen koan. You like the Zen koan. Maybe you should go to Zen Buddhism. Maybe, uh, maybe that's what. Maybe that's where you have your natural affinity to Zen Buddhism. Uh, so just go slowly. Uh, read things. Sometimes some of the very inspiring things can be the verse collections. Yeah, read a bit in Dhammapada perhaps. Uh, try something like the Theragata and Terigata. These are the ancient verses of the ancient monks and nuns. Uh, sometimes can be very inspiring. Uh, uh, read things like the first book of the Connected Discourse of the Buddha, which is full of short little suttas uh, that often are very nice. Uh, you, you, the one I read upstairs about how to slim, how to get slim. Yeah, you remember that one? Uh, yeah, that's quite nice, isn't it? It's quite a cute, cute little sutta. And but also it has full of suttas in there where the Buddha is supposed to talk to the to the to the devatas, to the devas, uh, and they're often very short and very concise, only a verse or two, and often very inspiring and beautiful. Uh. So look around for those parts of the Pali Canon that you find inspiring and enjoyable. Start with that, uh. and if you don't enjoy it still, if it still makes you fall asleep, put it aside. Don't do it. Uh. Come back to it in six months. Try again then. Yeah. And it's, it's so important that we enjoy the suttas. Uh, if it becomes a chore, I must read the suttas to be a good Buddhist, uh, then it is really problematic because we get aversion towards it. Uh, if you get aversion towards reading the suttas, it's, uh, it's not going to work for you. It's going gonna, it's gonna to stop your development uh, and eventually you're not going to be a Buddhist anymore. You're going to do something else. Uh, yeah? <laughs> and this, this, this is what happens sometimes. Uh, you're going to be converted to I don't know what. Uh, maybe. <laughs> So uh, make sure you enjoy. This, is, this is matters so much. So just try out various things until you come to a point when you start enjoying it. And if you never enjoy it, so be it. That's okay as well. Huh? So uh, check it out. Yes, David. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Good. Okay. Good. I'm. I'm, I'm glad. I'm glad to, glad to hear that. <laughs> That's good. Yeah. And sometimes you get you get tired as well. If you are, if you're already a bit tired already, and you have to try to think about something in the right way, it actually can tire you out more. So you can. These things can happen. Absolutely. <laughs> so okay. So we get more more balanced viewpoint now. That's good. Yeah. <laughs> good morning, Ajahn. Good morning. Talk about oh, yeah. Nietzsche, yeah. Right? So the flip side, I always have a thought that today is the last day in my life. Oh, it's a happy problem, I know, because <laughs> we have not finished all the sutta. <laughs> we have not got enlightened. Mm. But that thought keeps coming to my mind. Today is the last day in my life. Good, yeah. So, so yeah. sorry. Yeah. We have not got enlightened. Yeah. We have not gone to Sutta Which plane are you going to? Yeah, yeah. And then it's funny, yeah. you'll be a little bit sad. You know? Yeah. So, how to? Is it a right thought? Is it? Creating bad karma by thinking of this. <laughs> we, yeah. don't, we, we cannot predict when yeah. is the last day of our moment. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So how to, how to overcome this? Make it more positive. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah, it, it's like with so many things, it is uh, the most 
important thing is how how we use these things yeah and what impact they have on our mind that's really what matters uh, and uh, the impact of uh, uh, the death contemplation should really be that it gives you more clarity in life uh, it gives you more clarity it gives you a sense of priority uh, yeah if you know that you're going to die today and that is a real possibility then what does that mean and how you treat the people around you uh, and in my experience if i feel strongly that i could die today i'm going to be nice to people uh, how can i be you know say bad things to people if i know that i'm going to die today if i'm going to die in half I'm, am i going to have an argument with you Actually, I'm not going to have an argument with you anyway, probably, but would I want to have an argument with you if I know I'm going to die in half an hour? It would be crazy. I want to be peaceful if I'm going to die in half an hour. I don't want to argue with anyone. I want to be kind to people. So in a sense, it sets the mind straight. Yeah? And that is what you should be looking for. What does it do to your mind? And then when the mind becomes uh, you know, more straight like that, you have more clarity, then you go and read the sutta and you don't fall asleep. Yeah? <laughs> And because you are awake, you understand, now is my chance to kind of read the sutta, to gain some insight into these teachings. Uh, now is my chance to uh, do a bit of meditation practice, to be kind to other people. Actually, it, using the death contemplation in the right way is very, very powerful and very, very useful. Uh, uh, I, um, I remember, I, I often tell the story, I was a, uh, there was a man I met many years ago, he was from Sri Lanka originally, he was a psychologist. Uh, and he told me that every time he leaves his house in the morning, he thinks this might be the last time I m might see my wife and my children. Uh, and because if I could die in the traffic, yeah, on the way to work, uh, and because he thought that, he made sure he left his house in a good way. Uh, yeah, he said goodbye in a good way. He didn't kind of end up with an argument and then leave. Uh, he always makes sure he said goodbye in a good way. Uh, and uh, that's, very, that's a very positive way of using the death contemplation. Uh, you use it to make yourself more alive, make yourself more present, uh, uh, and give you that impetus to, uh, to live well. Uh. So, so check out how you do it, yeah? and make sure it leads to these kind of things. And if it does that, uh, then it is a very positive. If it just makes you a bit sad and, neg and maybe negative, then it's not really doing, doing the right thing. Uh. So try to think about it in the right way. You have to die one day anyway. Uh, yeah? There's not really much of a choice there. So, um, what is it like when you eventually die here? Huh? Yeah, and uh, bring that into the present moment uh, and see if it, uh, if, if it makes a difference for you. Huh? And uh, yeah. Second question uh, yeah. I've seen a super normal human being here uh, when we invited Sile Dipankara come uh? here before give a talk. Okay. And then he can conduct two day sessions, meditation and retreat. Yeah. When we serve her drink, one is to one, she say my whole body is very sick, but she still can smile. She, how she can control her own body in such a way that she is very sick, she's having fever, but she still can smile, still can give talk. Yeah. These are super normal human beings. <laughs> how yeah, yeah. the Sangha yeah. members able yeah. to forget their body when the body is so, she say all her joints are very sick. Very painful. Really? Okay. Yeah. 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 She's still smiling. She's still yeah. giving talk. She lasts for two days of uh, meditations. Yeah. This superhuman power, how <laughs> to get it? How to get it? <laughs> <laughs> Be careful of greed. Yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> so. <laughs> How to, how to get it is that, again, you, you develop your mind. Yeah? You make the mind the main thing. Yeah? And you build up a mind that is happy, that is bright, that has all the right qualities. Yeah? And as the mind becomes bright, you live in the mind and the body becomes less important. Yeah? That's how you do it. Yeah? The more developed your mind is, the more ability you have to enter samadhi, the more joy you have in the mind, the more the mind has all these qualities, yeah? the more you identify with the mind and the less you identify with the body. Yeah? The body becomes part of the external world. The body is not no longer so important to you. Huh? You can look at it, uh, you can kind of almost ignore it a little bit because your inner happiness, that's where you get happiness. Uh. So that is really the supernormal power. It's not, a, it's not really a supernormal power at all, obviously. And, uh, uh, but still, even then, the body is going to be unpleasant. Yeah? It's still going to be bad to have pain. So s still, the fact that she was able to smile is still quite, quite still is difficult, yeah? if, even if you have that uh, change of identity. Yeah? So it's still kind of, she obviously have to probably
put in quite a bit of mindfulness and work to be able to do that, uh, even at the time. Uh, but that is essentially what it is about. Uh, and ultimately, you can do the same thing, yeah, if you want to, if you keep on developing, uh, then one day you also will, uh, will get there. Uh, it can be done, uh, yeah? That's kind of the proof of the pudding. If someone else can do it, you can also do it. Uh. And I remember Ajahn Brahm was t telling the story, I told this many stories many times, but uh, the story when he had typhoid fever or whatever it is in, in, in Thailand, he, when he was very, very sick as a consequence, uh, and he could barely walk, that's how sick he was, he had to go to the toilet, he could barely go to the toilet, it was only 10 meters away, but he had to kind of hold on to things to be able to do it. Uh, but he was able to go into deep meditation, yeah. Uh, just let go of the body, let go completely, just identify with the mind and let go of everything. Yeah and uh, just experience bliss, even though the body is, uh, is problematic. Yeah. So it is that ability to identify in the right place that is really the important one. Yeah. Okay, yeah. <laughs> something which I experienced before. I used to try to read one sutta a day during the beginning of the day so that I won't be so tired. Yeah. Uh, but unfortunately, I, you know, as time goes on, I got into more and more WhatsApp groups. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and I find that, to my horror, I was a bit assisted to read already. Yeah. You know? But most of the WhatsApp groups are Buddhist groups and all that. Yeah. And we share, you know, like Dharma or whatever, our health issues. But then I actually, Ajahn, you really inspired me to go back to that uh, <laughs> habit, you know, of reading a sutta. Yeah. Because I had the retires on me. I put it near my computer table so that when I had finished computer work, I would read something, you know, at least one sutta. Yeah. But I, I find it so delightful. Sometimes I go from one to two and three, the very short ones as Ajahn recommended. Yeah. And some of them really make you laugh, you know, they are so. Delightful. Yeah. Uh, so beautiful. So I think I should go back to that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. Excellent. Yeah, wonderful. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. That's great. <laughs> the, the girl okay. Was delivering the wonderful Dharma Shari. There are. After this, you'll be proceeding downstairs for the, to offer lunch dana to Achan. Uh, all are welcome to do the offering. And for those who like to offer Navakama to Ajahn, there's a tray there. You can uh, put your offerings and then we can pass it to Ajahn. And we can uh, take on behalf of Ajahn and uh, send it to the Buddhist society in Perth. Okay. So, uh, downstairs. Uh, so, can we ask, invite Ajahn to do some sharing of merits? Sharing of merits, okay, can do. Can, okay. So, just. Um Set your intentions on sharing the merit with your relatives uh, and anyone else. Uh, and here we go. Edang menyati nang hotu sukita hontu nyata yo. Edang menyati nang hotu sukita hontu nyata yo. Edang menyati nang hotu. Sukita hontu nyata yo. Sadu, sadu, sadu. <laughs>